So, um, actually, what I'm talking about has quite a lot of relevance to what we've been finding on site today, as we'll see shortly, particular discussion of wet wood and big posts. Um, and big posts are going to feature quite prominently in this uh, presentation. So, the title, no, oh, it's not quite so. the title of the presentation, when you formally, is Down by the River Excavations of Prehistoric, prehistoric even Triple Coast Alignment in the way the Valley Suffolk. Its sort of subtitle or alternative title is Peaks and Points of Sticks, because that's largely what it's about. So that's why it's great talking to you guys about it, because uh, by definition you're all being here, you all love Peaks and Points of Sticks, don't you? So that's good. Um, I'd initially intended to, um, to co opt two of my um, uh, companions in arms for these, this project. That's Michael, of course, and you all know. And Christina, uh, Michael's gone to London, and Chris is not back from Birmingham yet, so sort of their, their images here. Other people have been involved in this project as well, my colleague Henry Chapman, particularly Dirty, there in the trench. Um, so there's a variety of people who've been involved in this work, and their identities and their voices may come clear as we go through this really. So the study area is sort of the southeast of where we are, um, the lower end of the Wavy Valley, which is um, over in Suffolk, it's actually the Suffolk Norfolk border. So we're right on the bottom of the Norfolk Broads. In fact, the River Waveney is sort of a Broads River, so it's always got people cruising and down, going off and going off on the Broads holidays from there. So we're basically the East End of Fenland, really, if you like. So stretching, you know, it's a fence stretch all the way across really from here, so we're effectively part of the same landscape. Very similar landscape basically as you'll see. Um, just a bit of background to the work. This work goes back about five years now. It began as an English heritage funded project. It was actually looking at the river valleys in Suffolk and looking at the archaeological potential being ready for work done in Suffolk at the time, particularly looking at the river valleys and the weapon record. Um, and it sort of developed as it went, it went along really, as you'll see. So this is the area I'm mainly talking about, um, Beckles, uh, just in just in <coughs> Great Yarmouth. I don't know if been to Great Yarmouth, a pretty charming place. Um, we spent several seasons staying there. And just to zoom in on that area a bit more, there's three sites I'm going to talk about. First, I'm going to talk about Beckles, which most work has been done. I'm going to talk about uh, Barsham, which has had slightly less work, and Galveston, which has had a reasonable amount of work, but it's most recent. So in terms of the sort of post ex process is slightly behind things. There is reason to believe, as you'll see as we go along, that Barsham and Belson are actually the same site. So, I'll come back to that shortly. So as you probably all realise by now, um, the problem with wetland archaeology, with archaeology in peace, is very hard to find it, and we generally don't know it's there until someone digs a hole through it. And this is no different, basically, in this, in this case. The work involved the engineering work involved initially in finding this archaeology was this, the Broadland and Flood Alleviation Project, which is, what you can see there, it's a 20-year project, it's improving the flood defences of Broadland, basically. Um, it's part, effectively part of the manager retreat in the face of rising sea levels and so forth. It's a very big project, about £25 million of the project. Um, that said, it's not enormously elaborate in engineering terms. Basically, what they're doing is they're going up the river valleys, they're reprofiling the ditches, they're excavating new ditches, they're building up the riverbank fences using these fantastic digs with massive long arms. So it's not really a highly technical piece of work. But what it, what it does lead to is enormous transects in places through the landscape. This isn't the Waveney Valley, but um, this is a tributary valley, valley off the Waveney. And as Christine in the bottom of the trench, you can see how big some of these, these uh, excavations are. They're absolutely enormous. So this is this isn't through peaks, it's through some alluvial deposits. But the upshot's the same. Whenever you dig big um, ditches or big channels up uh, river valley, river valley is filled with peat in this case, um, there's always a chance you can find something that you don't know is there. As, as you probably all know by now, geophysics isn't working like them. So the first, generally the first sense you have about archaeology is when you dig it up. That sense of the problem straight away, of course, because once you've dug it up, you deserve, deserve the burial environment, as we all know by now. You've got problems because you can't just go, oh, let's pretend we can find it and rebury it again because the burial ground is compromised and you've got all sorts of problems. So, this is the Beckles site, which is just to the north of the rather charming market town of Beckles. Um, so, this is going back to 2006, I think now. So, they were, as part of this programme, they were excavating these um, drainage ditches up the river. And the diggers started pulling out big wooden posts. Now the posts looked so fresh that initially they ignored them. The uh, 
chap struggling to dig is just sort of the modern fence posts. Now there was a watching brief on the site, an archaeological watching brief. The archaeologist was only there three days a week, so it wasn't for two or three days. After this discovery, the archaeologist came along, looked at some of these posts and went, you know, they're not modern fence posts, as we'll see shortly. So we noticed new straight away, basically, there was big posts. Some of them had, that hadn't been pulled out by the digger looked like this, a cluster of three posts, as you can see, very distinctive carpentry joints, halving lap joints, we'll come back to that shortly. So effectively led in 2006 to the first season of excavation of the disturbed area. So you can see there, that is a disturbed area. Ooh, hello. Um, you can see where the bank is being, the ditch is being dug around the corner there, you can see where the peat's being disturbed, so it's a big peat filled valley. So similar rich environments here with Flag Femme, but the River Waveney is literally just to the left there, you see where the bank is and the trees, that's the river. The river sits proud, the river is above the level of the land here to some banks, the drainage is controlled. So it's really odd when you're digging on sites, it's sort of boats which sort of going over your head along the river. So we had a seasonal excavation in 2006, in which the weather was rather like what we might have had recently, actually, really, really hot. And there was a team of students from the IAA, which were several here today, of course, um, and Suffolk County Council archaeologists involved as well. Huge amount of wood debris, test bit on today, of course, starting to get this sort of material. And um, we knew straight away we were dealing with something, um, potentially quite a large site, big posts, lots of wood debris. It took a while to make sense of what we were looking at really because, as we'll see shortly, the disturbance was somewhat oblique to the site. So this is looking back across the trenches to show you, looking back towards Beckles and the dry land. So the river waving it sort of over the shoulder of the photographer. Um, and if we just drop those lines on there like that, what we eventually became clear we were dealing with was some sort of post alignment site. So again, not similar to Flag Fen, just about make out three alignments there. The little blue circles of rope mark the top of really big posts, sort of big posts we're trying to obviously find in the test bit just across the field here. And indeed you can see the in situ posts in the drain can be plastic now. So the second year we came back and what I'm going to do is just run through the work, um, run through the archaeology and come back to sort of talk a little bit about interpretation. So I'm just going to give you a sort of program of work first if you like. So 2007 we came back to the site, trench two, and this time we were able to position the pre trench because we by that point we had an idea we did its alignment that we assumed was pretty straight. Um, and so initially proved, but that was actually an error, as you'll see shortly. Um, we were able to position the trench directly over the alignment. And this is what you can see here, this is our trench. See the PKs, they mark the top of the big posts that we found. So quite shallow in the peak, so maybe 60 or 70 centimetres down onto the top of the archaeology. And so this is plan of the first trench, so 2006, the first year. It's not a massively good plan, but you can probably just about make out the little black solid circles mark the top of big posts. And there's other features in the trench as well, particularly, as you can see, bottom right of the picture, a, a brushwood trackway feature that seems to be coming off the site and running towards the river, which is to the, you know, to the west, effectively, of the plan there. And lots of other um, concentrations of wood, both archaeological wood and natural wood in the trench as well. 2007, so our second year, when we popped over and moved down the alignment, it's a bit clearer there. You can see the circles, the empty circles, show the alignment. So you can see it's roughly triple, but not always, because in places you seem to get an extra post off the side there. Some places the posts are single, in other places they're uh, double, and in, I think two cases triple clusters of posts. And again, some other odd features, not massively good picture showing it very well. Top left there, again, some sort of brushwood structure towards the, um, the sort of northern end of the trench there. And other features, so for example, bottom left, that's a tree bowl in the peat. So that's a tree that's been grown in the peat, and it's been sort of chopped down, presumably as they're laying out the alignment. You see the bottom picture right there. That's, that's wood that's been chopped from the tree and sort of thrown on the surface of the peat, maybe as a, as a rough working surface or something. So to pull up 2006-2007 together, that's what we sort of ended up with after two seasons of work, basically. Um, around about 100 metres of alignment in the black spots there showing the large posts. You can see there's other trenches to the east and west. We have reason to believe there might be features coming off, but those trenches are blank in the end. Certainly the alignment is, as you can see, heading towards the River Waveney. We couldn't extend anywhere to the north because that's basically hitting the river bank. Um, we also couldn't go digging through the river bank given they're just trying to build the river bank up. So we couldn't chase it any further to the north. So 
That led to a subsequent phase of work that was funded by, by English Heritage and a number of aims. Um, one of which, the initial one of which, was to trial a new geophysical technique that um, allegedly had the potential to find wood in peat. It's a bit of a holy grail, obviously. Um, it's called spectral induced polarisation, which is a mouthful. Um, so what we did initially is we set up the kit. This is Chris Gaffney, um, some of you may be familiar with, geophysicist from Bradford. We set up the kit over where we knew the line was, and we trialled this technique that was meant to find where the posts were in the peat, and it didn't. So I'm not going to talk about that anymore. Um, it did find some stuff. We also threw a whole load of other geophysical techniques at the site and at the alignment as well, just really to collect baseline data, which we're talking about a lot nowadays. Um, but I'm not going to talk much about geophysics, but very, very critical results really from that. Um, just to stress and say, critical to geophysics, that was me and Henry helping out with the geophysics lying in the sun. Um, as I say, I'm not a geophysicist, but if you want to ask me more about that technique, how I can tell you um, what I know of it. So really what, what that led, to, led us to is pretty much what we're doing here at Flag Fen in terms of trying to trace a structure. Okay, we've got more data here at Flag Fen in terms of where the alignment goes. Um, and it became really effectively what we call a wall chasing exercise in the old parlance. It was like, well, let's take the alignment, let's project it, um, let's hop over a bit and let's dig a trench. And at first that seemed to work quite well. So we hopped to the south of the 2007 trench, dug into the peat, straight away found this brushwood trackway feature, quite high up in the peat. Made out of copper solder. Um, and in that trench, we found the alignment again. So, again, big oak posts and a whole sort of jungle of, of the wood going on. Not quite as complicated as what we've got here at Flag Fen, but in places, you know, sort of really complex and quite hard to sort of understand, quite hard to plan, very hard to dig. You know, we've been digging, test bit one today, we'll know it's quite hard to dig wood in peat. Um, and test bit one at the moment is actually not that complicated. So when it gets really sort of jumbled with wood, it's horrible to do it, very difficult. This sort of gives you an idea of a triple post cluster, and in place you've got these round woods that have been sort of wedged in between the, um, between the posts as well. So again, chasings across the floodplain, trench four, a little bit further to the south. Again, we had the alignment again. Again, we had lots of bits of wood, lots of round woods. We start picking up other features like this. So just to the um, east of trench four, a large trimmed oak timber, sort of roughly parallel to the side in the piece. And trench five, trench five is a very unusual shape, as you can probably see on the plot there, because again we projected the alignment and, and, and started digging at one end, slightly to the east, and found actually that the site is swinging slightly back to the west, so you've got extension to see the photograph. And we picked up the alignment again in this trench. What I love about this picture is you can see the PK, it's a PK with a coat can on top. That's a great piece of surveying equipment we were using to sort of orientate ourselves across the landscape. So you can have GPSs, what you really need at the end of the day is a, is a PK and a coat can. What was interesting about that trench as well was the, the apparent the presence of a ground level structure. Up until that point we weren't particularly certain whether the post alignment had had any sort of ground level structure. What we seem to have in this trench, and just about to make it out, is a horizontal timber on the Iron Age ground surface, because we're talking about an Iron Age site, so we'll see shortly. We seem to have horizontal planks laid over it. Those planks are really degraded and dried out. Now we'll return to preservation shortly, but we have reason to believe that this is partly <coughs> due to the fact that in the Iron Age, um, after the site or around the time the site was built, the peat dried out a lot in a really dry period. That's probably also when the tops of the post rotted and fell off. So we're basically dealing with like half the site, if you like. So what's preserved is effectively what was below the water table in the Iron Age. When the peat started growing again, so you've got to only have half the site. It's one of the big problems with dealing with these sort of timber alignment sites, really, is you get brilliant preservation below a level, and above that level, everything's gone quite often. And if you throw in recent processes, we've been talking about that in the field today, recent changes in water table, that can exacerbate that situation even further. So, by the time we got to trench six, um, we've had other problems with the site, you can just see in this photograph here, that's a drain, a later drain has been cut through, partly to disturb the alignment. But again, what we seem to have here was another um, ground level walkway, you can see just to the left of the photo there, a whole number of timbers, split older timbers that have been laid on the surface of the pit. What we also have there is apparently a structural relationship between one of the big posts, the top of which you can see there, and one of these horizontal timbers. So, that may be suggested that perhaps the post didn't protrude very far, perhaps actually they were designed to support quite low down some sort of 
horizontal surface. However, rather frustratingly, there was evidence because of the later drain that this may have disturbed the site and actually moved that timber sort of across. So we weren't completely convinced that wasn't actually a particularly secure relationship. So by the time we hit landfall at Trench 8, basically what we're getting is rather like what we've got today in Trench 1 is the bottom of the site. So we're basically getting the tips of the posts, which is what we're seeing over here. So the preservation horizon sort of comes across onto what was dryland edge in prehistory, pretty much where we are at the south of the image. And we're basically getting just really the lower part of the site, so literally the post tips, which again is what we're seeing here. So what we had basically was this, and what we traced was this. Um, 500 metre long site, triple posts. Um, that's a big structure. Okay, it's not quite as big as, quite, not quite as big as flag fen, but it's still a sizable structure as you'll see. Very unusual structure. So literally in 2007, after we'd broken ground at Bethel's, we had a phone call saying, can you pop just at the river for a way because we think we found another site, which was, was ironic. So we had an argument with the developers saying, you know, you're going to find more sites in the Peatlands if you keep going to the river and keep digging holes. You're going to find more archaeology. It's bound to happen, and you know we proved we proved right. 2007, um, just at the River Barsham. Again, you can see where they've come around the corner with the digger, and they fit the archaeology. And again, a similarish structure. So triple post alignment. They well, we'll see the plan in a minute. It's not quite as convincing, partly because it's been so heavily disturbed by the by the actual excavators themselves in digging the ditch out. You can see the red pegs, they're making, marking the top, top of posts. And that's a plan of the site, so it's not as if we only had a small section of it, because we were literally limited to where, where they disturbed it. Um, so about you know, 25, 30 metres of site, basically. Um, you can see it's a sort of an alignment, whether it's triple or not, you can maybe argue the toss, but as I say, you can see how it's been disturbed in the middle. Basically what the developers did, they came round, they obviously pulled out some archaeology, and thought, oh, hell. Sort of hopped on a bit, hoping to avoid it, started again, found some more, and obviously at that point they thought, oh hell, we have to call the archaeologists thing, because there was a lot of bad feeling at the time by some of the people, some of the developers working the site, because they didn't really have an archaeology budget, um, which for a £25 million project that's been paid for by the environment agency, agency is a bit off. We sat in a number of meetings where they got quite heated about this. Transpired later on, they'd also forgot to um, budget for tree clearance, um, you know, work at the River Valley. So they already, they already had problems with the budget because they really, someone hadn't put a cost in for clearing trees. Um, so they got quite jumpy about this. Anyway, that's another safe box entirely. So two sites, two triple alignment sites. This is the third one. This is Gelders, and this is um, last year's uh, project, last year's student training dig. It was also building on some work being carried out by the archaeological consultants to um, Halpro Bezel, developers, um, the previous year. When once again, coming back down the other side of the river, this time excavating a dike that was running at right angles to the river, so the river is in the, in the, well, the trees on the background, digging a dike back this way. Once again, they all started pulling posts out of the ground. And so we came back the year after the initial assessment had been done, trying to again try to chase this alignment. Um, and this is our trench, so heading towards the dryland edge. You can see just on the right there's a sort of flood defence embankment, and that's what they were going to excavate when they found the archaeologists had to move that along basically. So we had another summer last, last year, slightly mixed weather conditions. Um, and again, digging up pointy steps and peat. Similarish form of site again. Roughly triple alignment, but again, because the material had been moved from the middle and basically chucked away, it's quite hard to sort of understand the form of the site. What we did seem to discover was, again, we were basically hoping we could chase the alignment all the way to the dry land. I mean, rather like here, we hope, you know, what's happening in the dry land then? You know, can we chase it all the way? As it was, the site was seen to stop in the middle of the floodplain. Um, other features we found on the site were well, post and situ. You can see how deep down we go. And they're really deep down, and very hard to lift out. And also, another horizontal walk walking surface associated with this, with this site as well. I, I put this picture in just because it amuses me. I can't think why. But that's, um, that's Michael and Henry um, trying to, trying to uh, lift, lift the post out. There's something faintly sinister about it. But anyway, let's move swiftly on. So the plans haven't been drawn up actually very well from Gelson yet, so this isn't a massively good image, but what you can see here is um, the, this is the sort of northern part of our trench, the blue circles mark the posts. Um, very little wooden debris at this site, other than the posts. Very little wooden debris at Barsham compared to Beckles. 
So the big alignments, the main features basically. Um, but you can just about see it as an alignment, again, sort of moving away from the river. So at Gelston we have maybe, I don't know, maybe 60 or 70 metres in total. Alignment. Um, and this is sort of what some of the big sticks look like, some of the big point sticks. This is um, some of the big pencil point timbers from Gelston. It's a photograph of them, some drawings. Um, oak timbers in the large. Most, mostly oak timbers we're talking about. Occasionally older. Um, finds um, all three sites. Brilliant thing about digging weapon sites to find last few years is um, we never find any treasure at all. So none of that at all, unfortunately. Um, not like Flagfen here. No metal work. Um, no treasure. Nothing shiny. But quite a lot of these. A large amount of posts from, from all the sites. So this is from one of the bigger posts from Beckles. You can see how big that post is. That's about two metres long. Um, sharp into a pencil point. You can see very beautiful woodworking. With one of these slightly off wood joints in the top, it's a halving lap joint. And a wide sort of range of posts, these are from Beckles, so these are ones, a selection of ones we lifted, you can see the sort of variation in the form of the timbers that are coming out basically. What's also, also interesting about this, if you look at the timber that's the third in from the right hand end, you can see a slight curve on it, that timber is derived from overgrown coppice, so some of this wood is certainly from managed woodland basically. So it's coppice woodland, it's grown out, it's overgrown and they're basically cutting it off at the coppice heel. You can also see the range of lengths, different lengths that survive. And what you see at these sites is basically the, um, that is determined by how deep the post is shoved in the first instance. So obviously the deeper it's shoved in, the more of them survive. And you find variation across the site. That's across Beckles. So you can see you vary from really big posts to so just really small tips in the ends of them there. And what you can do with that is effectively work out a rough rule of thumb as to how far those posts might protrude above the original ground. <coughs> and if you do that at Beckles, you get maximum post lengths of total post lengths of maybe two to maybe six metres. Um, so that's equating to above the ground of maybe 1.2 to maybe four metres. So that's quite a lot of posts potentially protruding above the ground when these posts are put in originally. I've mentioned sort of jointing the, the um, horizontal the lap joints that we spotted in the first season. Just about to see that in that picture there. We wonder what they're for. Initially we thought they were maybe for designed to support a superstructure. We thought you know maybe these notches were designed to support and we got something up. Um, then in the second year what we found was actually one of the joints had a, a round that shoved through it. You can see that on the bottom picture there. So what they seem to be using the lap joints for is something a little bit like this. Um, either to aid insertion of the posts in that way and possibly once they're inserted to stop them slipping further into the ground. So that seems to be the function of the, of the, the lap joints. They don't seem to be designed to support anything in the, in the structure. That also seems to be borne out by the fact that the, the actual joints all point in different directions on the alignment. They don't point in the same way which you might expect if it was, a, if it was something structural. Um, other odd features, this is from Gelderson last year, this had a, a lap joint or some sort of old joint cut towards the, the bottom of the tip, so that's the tip obviously on the right there and it seems to have had some sort of notch cut in at the bottom. Not entirely certain what that's for, maybe for, maybe it's just a mistake in the, in the original cutting, maybe it was designed to, um, maybe it had a rope round, maybe it was used to, to, to drag the pace across the wetland, we're not entirely, not entirely certain. But you get these really nice features on prehistoric wood like this. And what's also fa fascinating is the fact you get a real range of different woodworking styles. So you get some that works really, really well, really beautifully, and others that are just really shoddily. And it's quite interesting to think about that. It's, there's lots of theories on, you know, it's just going to go in the ground, so why does it look some, like, have to look really nice and neat? Or, you know, maybe it's because somebody cared about the work. And someone else was like, oh, I don't guess you've got to go in the ground, let's just do it quickly. So you get this real sort of range of tool marks that are beautifully preserved when they come out of the ground. Of course, the big problem is once these timbers are out of the ground, as we all know, is they degrade really quickly. So once you've lifted a timber like this, you have to keep it wet. Obviously, hence the paddling pool, which hasn't been used for any timber yet. But you need to keep your timber wet once it's out of the ground because the tool marks, if you've got tool marks on the wood, they degrade really quickly. They'll dry out, they'll crack, as you'll see in a minute. Once that happens, the information from the wood is gone completely, and you may as well literally throw it on the bonfire. Completely pointless. Okay, so we didn't get a huge amount of material culture, we didn't get pottery. We've got Iron Age pottery um, at Beckles, um, Iron Age pottery at Gelderston as well, and Romano British pottery, uh, first, second century pottery at um, 
backwards as well. So we had a faint idea, plus the tool marks, of course, Mike had looked at the tool marks and gone, well, probably not Bronze Age, probably Iron Age. Obviously, the Roman, Roman pottery seems to be leading us towards that, the Beckles in particular. And a huge amount of wood, I mean, a really sort of big assemblage, just getting not quite on the scale of, um, of the flag fen, but, you know, real quantities of wood within the, within the alignments. And what's interesting about the wood remains is what, what you can do with bits of wood, with wood chips. Or rather, what Mike Banthard can do with wood chips, basically. And what's curious about Beckles is if you look at the wood chips and you analyse the wood chips, you can analyse them by species, so what species of tree they come from, and what the conversion is, so i.e. how has that wood been derived, what is the nature of the conversion, you can see something slightly strange because we get a whole load of oak wood chips, a lot of which seems to come from shaping the posts themselves, so the pencil point. So that's waste material from that. So we know that they're basically cutting these posts on sand, and that's debris there as well. What we also have, though, is the, a certain amount of wood waste, which is definitely oak, but is from, has come from timbers that are bigger than the alignment timbers. So what that seems to suggest is they are making something on site, they're reducing something on site, but it's not the alignment timbers, something that's bigger than the post of the alignment, we don't know what that is. So, again, if you can throw that one out to the floor, my initial excitement was, well, maybe talking about boat yard near the river, you know, maybe, maybe we're making boats, there's no real evidence of that. Mike later said, well, maybe it's the fact that maybe this wood debris has actually nothing to do with what they're doing on site. Maybe they're bringing it in from, from the dry land to stabilise the peat surface, to walk on it, and that's possible as well. But it's a really sort of tantalising hint that there might be something, they may be doing something on site, they may have been working wood to build something, superstructure, I don't know, but it's not, we've not recovered, we've not seen yet. So dates, okay, I mentioned dates, also leads to the fact that sites are um, around age. Um, we've got some good dendro dates, so this is from Barsham, for various technical reasons, there's a range of dates on that, so it's really, really late Iron Age Barsham, right into the early Roman period, 8 BC to 8 AD, dendro dates from there. Possibly some of the timbers from the Barsham are really used, there's evidence for that as well. Beckles, really interesting, um, the felling date from Beckles is spring of 75 BC. So you can't, you, know, you can't get really get much more precise than that. So right at the back end of the Iron Age, so you know, 25 years, 20, 20 years, sorry, before Julius Caesar's expedition, really late Iron Age, basically. And we have those dates across the alignment and down the alignment. So it looks like the whole structure has been built in a single phase, because we have those dendro dates all the way down the side. Okay, so one of my pet sort of Subjects at the moment is chronology and time, which is an archaeological staple, archaeological staple. But in some ways, well, we, we're talking more and more about the time and chronology nowadays than we used to. And um, we tend to conflate time and chronology and say, think the same thing, or not at all. And um, chronology, you derive time from chronology. And how do we get chronology? Well, archaeologically, maybe from radiocarbon date, maybe from dendro. So what do we know about 75 BC? So it's great to have that date. And here's a few things we do know about 75 BC. So Cicero is quoted in Rome, the Mithridatic War. Um, Julius Caesar travels to Rhodes, where he's kidnapped by Sicilian pirates. and held for ransom for 20 talents, but Sicilian insists they asked for 50. Um, they actually paid 50 talents and let him go. And then being Julius Caesar, what he later did was uh, sail off and find them and have them all crucified. So uh, that's, that's JC for you, really, isn't it? Also, apparently, sarcasm was invented in 75 BC. I didn't know that. I think it's something to do with the dawning of the golden age of Latin literature, uh, Latin literature. So okay, so the point I'm trying to make is that some, having an exact dendro date, 75 BC for me is something that is brilliant, but in a sense, how does it help us interpret the site other than the fact it's really precise? What else do we know about the Iron Age in 75 BC other than the fact it's late Iron Age? So I'm just going to throw that out there. What we can also do, and what we've also done, is pick apart the chronology of the site a little bit. So we know the post alignment is 75 BC, plotted on the Soxcal plot, this is a Bayesian analysis. If you don't know what Bayesian analyses are now, you will, you should shortly. Massive revolution in archaeological dating that's happening at the moment. And what we see in this is there was actually a bit of time depth in the site, which we probably imagine anyway. So our two brushwood structures talked about earlier. One of them seems to post, uh, predate 75 BC, and one of them post 75 BC. The corduroy structure, that I mentioned earlier on, that's Romanic British as well. So there's time depth in the site. So the site is late Iron Age. It's activity on the site slightly before 75 BC, slightly after, certainly 
in their own brim on a British food as well. Okay, so I'm going to pull things together now because it's hot in here, everyone's tired and hungry. So how do we interpret these sites? So I'm just going to sort of throw this out here. This is a, an information board that the Broads Authority produced to put on the river bank next to the site, because it's right next to Broads Authority uh, land, basically. So what, what we're talking about, well, these are, I quite like this reconstruction drawing, sort of going from the, from the present to the past. I think we can interpret the site as an alignment like that. Like I think almost certain posts were designed to be visible, were designed to protrude quite a long way above the surface, as I said earlier, two to possibly four metres above the ground. If you imagine a 500 metre long structure, a post like that, marching across the landscape, even now that's quite impressive. So we're talking about a big engineered structure, a very visible one. What's also important is its landscape context. And um, rather like Flag Fen, you cannot understand the wetland site without understanding the landscape context. You haven't got a hope in hell. So you need to know what is going on. You need to know what's going on, in this case, in the river valley on the area around. Now, not to go on about this too much, what we do know Beckles Marshes is the site is right at the head of the estuary in later prehistory. So the Beckles alignment literally is probably the sort of first dry land that you would have come to if you're coming up the estuary in the later prehistoric period. So that landscape context I think is critical to how we understand and interpret the site. What's also important is to look at it in the broader archaeological context. Um, this is Anne Age Suffolk, and that's our story area in the red box. Um, we're basically right in the heart of the Canaan territory, that's Boudicca's tribe, some of the stuff about the other day. Um, so we're not on the boundary, we're not on, there's no sort of border, obviously Norfolk's sort of boundary of the river Wayne today, it's not a tri tribal boundary in the Iron Age, so we're talking about a site that appears to be right in the middle of the Canaan territory. And again, if we look at the sort of local context, it's not a massively good image this, but you can see the alignment, Barsham, except effectively, we think Barsham and Gales in the same structure. So we think that alignment is probably at least 500 metres long as well, going all the way across the floodplain. Beckles alignment, you can see, runs parallel to the river. The river's not moved much since prehistory, so the landscape context is much the same. It's a transect across the river that we talk about. And at first we wondered why it did that, because that's in a really odd angle. But actually, that is a shorter distance from dry land, or contemporary dry land, which marks is marked by the southern end of the Beckles arrow in prehistory. That's shorter distance across to the dry land in the current route across the floodplain, which is not by the road alley. So it seems to be a practical angle in that in terms of crossing the floodplain, accessing the river. And which brings us back to the river. And how do we interpret the site? Well, these, these are massive visible structures. The Beckles ones laid out in a single phase, 75 BC. How is it being used? Well, again, bang on about this, we'll maybe talk about it later. I think rather like like Fen has an aspect of ritual to it, I think as an aspect of practical to it. So I think it's marking a routeway to the river, I think it's providing access to the river, and I think people can move them down the river. I think it's a highly visible territorial marker. You think about the political climate in 75 BC, increasing contacts with the continent, and we know that people are using rivers in prehistory, going up and down rivers to trade for whatever reason, probably more than more than we used to sort of think that was the case. So if you think about coming up a river, you were coming up that river down the river, you can't miss, miss these structures, particularly in flat fen and flat is around here. And this would have been a really, these would have been really big visible structures, territorial markers maybe, possibly marking route from dry land. So just to tie up, um, again it's difficult to interpret these sites because there aren't many of them that are similar. Flag fen is one, but similar in some ways as we've seen. Probably the, another one that's similar is Fiskerton in uh, Lincolnshire, you, know, you may have heard this site mentioned. Again, Iron Age alignments, um, different in some ways, uh, more ritual method work, uh, multi-phased as well. Um, so we have to look at those sites as well. And I mentioned what happens to wood when you leave it out, archaeological wood, this is just demonstrates this. On the left is a post that the developers have hoiked out of the ground, sort of left it lying around, it dried out and ended up like that basically, compared to that stretched out of the ground. It's the problem with stabilising wood. Something we've been doing in Birmingham, alternative ways of preserving wood, it's extremely expensive to conserve wood, as you probably know. So we've been looking at ways of effectively virtual preservation, that's 3D laser scanner, uh, and that's a screen grabber, but that's a 3D image that, so you can manipulate it, turn it around the computer. You can see you can move the light source so you can analyse the, the cut marks, and that's the particular point uh, of the state from Gelderstein. So 
just other ways of dealing with wet weapons archaeology and things that pull out of the ground and chilling in a wet tank or uh, spending a lot of money conserving them. Something else important, mentioned a few times here as well, water table monitoring. Again, very quickly, what we know at Backwards is the site for most of the year is below the water, uh, sorry, is above the water table. So rather like flag fan, it's probably not preservable in situ in the long term. What we also see at Beckles is the fact that the movement of the water table is really odd along the linear structure. Um, again, this is probably relevant to Flat Fen. The water table can do odd things. So, actually, some bits of the site of Beckles are, are below the water table for a lot of the year, other bits are not at all. So, if you have a linear structure, you can't just take one point in your water table and go, well, you know, that's representative because it might not be. So, this is why it's a management problem dealing with these sorts of sites. Which is part, you know, part of what we're doing here as well at the moment. You need to collect the baseline data and look at the preservation. You need to understand what your water table's doing and how it relates to the preservation. You need to look at the water geochemistry and how that affects it. Really complicated, but really exciting and really sexy stuff. Okay, so that's the end. I'm not going to talk about future peat and archaeology. Um, of course, I'm tired and you guys are all tired as well. Um, but what I'm going to show you just to finish off is it's been lovely and hot so far. But beware! Because that might happen. Yes. And I'll stop there, so thank you for bearing with me.